Welcome back, everyone. Today, we're going to start off this episode showing you all of the stuff that I dug up out of the cistern. But before I get into that, I want to explain to you why all this 110-year-old junk means so much to me. Back in 1998, I started buying this house from my grandmother, and my grandparents bought this place in 1974 as a rental, and that's why I bought it, because I wanted to get into the rental business. But over the years of me fixing up the house, I started to get a real feel for the house, like it was talking to me. So I went to the Historical Society just to see if I could find any information on the original owners, and I kind of won the jackpot because they printed me up nearly 40 pages of newspaper articles from the original owner through all of his great-great-grandchildren. And uh, I was just amazed that uh, I could find so much information on, uh, on the people that used to live here. So here's a short story of the history. The guy's name was H. L. Spiesman. He was uh, German and uh, he lived in Oberhausen, Germany. And he came over to the United States when he was 13. So imagine that, being 13 years old, leaving your home, uh, going on a boat, um, traveling probably two weeks on water to end up somewhere in New York City probably, and probably not knowing anybody over there. And uh, I assume from what I read in the obituaries that he brought his older brother with him. And by older brother, I mean... Uh, he was 14 years old, so his brother was one year older than he was. And uh, these kids are just, uh, you know, on a boat together going over to New York City to learn a new trade and start a life. And um, that's what HL did. He apprenticed as a, uh, a cobbler, and he learned the trade. And then he moved to a place called... Youngsville, Pennsylvania. That's about uh, half an hour east of us here. And uh, that's where he, he met a lady named Margaret Finlan, and he later married her uh, by 1863. And uh, they moved to this place, the city of Cory, C-O-R-R-Y, uh, not to be confused with my name, C-O-R-Y. I know, I'm Cory from Cory, but uh, <laughs> stop laughing. All right, so... <laughs> So they moved here in 1865. Um, I imagine they uh, they rented for a couple of years, or maybe they they lived in uh, the building above where he worked because he started a shoe store over on First Avenue. That is uh, a block over that way to the south, and then uh, a block and a half over east. So not very far from where I'm at now. I walk it. I walk by uh, with the dogs every day. So uh, he started a business there. I assume it was with his older brother. Uh, his name was uh, Matthias. Matthias Spiesman. What a name, huh? So those two were shoemakers together until uh, 1865, where he bought out his brother, and his brother moved to Titusville, which uh, was down that way. So I should say the whole reason that the city of Cory was created uh, was 1861, and uh, it was created as an oil refinery town because uh, Titusville, where Matthias had moved to, um, was where uh, oil was discovered in this area. So they needed a place to... Um, to refine it, and Oil City was one of them that was on the other side of Titusville. Titusville, and on this side, was just a piece of land where a couple train tracks are going through, and they figured that was a good place to put some, some uh, tanks and start refining some oil. So uh, by 1865, four years later after this place was created, uh, the city was created, they decided uh, that was probably a good place to make some shoes because back then not everyone had uh, horses and things like that. You know, there was a lot of train traffic through here. Uh, booming towns, starting towns like that had a lot of people thinking, you know, this is a great place to start a new life. So um, they did. And uh, he made a lot of shoes and apparently quite a lot of money because by 1860, oops, excuse me, 1875, he went in business with a guy named Jacob Franz, who was also probably German. And um, I would say back then, if you spoke the same tongue, you already had something in common with someone else. So that was probably how they got to, to meet each other. And uh, by 1875, they created a, a brick building because the city was starting to become a little more substantial by that point. Everything was wood prior to that, called the Union Block. And uh, the building on, it was, it's two buildings put together. That's what creates a block. And the building on the left was H.L. Spiesman's, and the building on the right was Jacob Franz. He owned a, uh, a furniture store, and then H.L. Uh, had the shoe store. So uh, that went on well, and they had five kids here in this house. Um, 
there is a Miss Thomas McMahon. Now, <laughs> back then, if you're a lady, I assume um, you, you just kind of lost your first name when you got married. You know, you're you're Mrs. Somebody. You're not. You, you have no, long, no longer have an identity. You know, so I have no idea what her first name was. But Mrs. Thomas McMahon. That was um, she was probably the third or fourth kid in there. I'm not sure of the dates of when everyone was born. They don't say that here. Uh, then there was a Miss Mary Speisman. She never uh, married. Uh, she lived. Uh, she was the last one to live here. She stayed here till 1925 when she passed away from a from an illness that that lasted about a couple weeks. She died over in her sister's house in Meadville, another city south of us. And uh, there was a J. L. Speisman, uh, one of the kids. Uh, he was that's Joseph Leonard, by the way. So uh, Leonard was the H was the L and the H L Speisman. As far as the H goes, uh, it's unknown, but most likely it was probably. Um, something harder to pronounce, something more German, and maybe not so common for the United States. So I think that's why he went with Leonard, um, because it was easy to remember. So, uh, then they had two other kids. There was a Harriet. Uh, she was the first one to be born, and unfortunately she died in infancy. And then there was a Charles, uh, also named after uh, H.L.'s brother, um, youngest brother. And uh, he only lived to be eight years old, unfortunately, and died here too. So... Um, of the five kids, only three of them survived. And uh, Joseph there, JL, he's the one that took over the business and uh, moved. Uh, after he grew up, he moved to a house on First Avenue, same place as the shoe store. So that is pretty much the history of the place. So let's get into the stuff. There are 14 boxes of artifacts, which I had to filter all the dirt and uh, sand off of to get them to what they look like today. And there's not enough room on the table for everything. So I have some categories out here. There's glass over on this side. And uh, we have things like canning jars. There's part of a wine bottle. There's uh, one of those bottles for, uh, for sickness, medicine bottle, another canning jar. And uh, this bottle is uh, for consumption. So consumption back then is what we call tuberculosis today. And that was very possible what uh, Mr. Speisman uh, could have died from. He might have had tuberculosis and then going to that funeral that may have aggravated it and uh, eventually causing his death. So, so many things. Here's a cup they would have drank out of. This is a very similar cup to what I have today. Uh, just um, like a beer cup or wine or, you know, water cup. And over here, we have all the pottery pieces uh, that I put out. There's a little cup handle there. They would have drink it out of a, a little teacup with that handle on it. And there's a lot of uh, iron stone or stoneware, I guess they call it iron. Iron stone, that's the name of it right there. And uh, made in England. This one's J.G. Meekin, I believe. And uh, there's a unicorn over on that side and a lion. And they're both uh, either side of an oval seal. And uh, very durable stuff, so not many of these pieces broke. And um, this is a chamber pot, because they didn't have bathrooms in those days. So that's why it's the color that it is. Here's one of those marbleized um, doorknobs that was uh, in the house. I still have a few of those things left. And uh, it's a really rusted fork. And what's left of a spoon, they would have they would have eaten off this. Pretty amazing. Now these are peach pits. I, I was surprised to find those things in there. So, but after I did, I went and planted a peach tree in the yard. And we have some bones. This is uh, probably, well, not probably. It's, uh, I checked with the zoning for the city back then and it was okay to have animals in your yard. So we got uh, some pig and sheep, goat probably. And um, I imagine that's a vertebrae to a, to a pig. Maybe could have come off a cow, but I don't think they had a cow. And um, these, they would have been, you know, being fed in their yard and eating the, the lawn and stuff like that. There was a barn here, and uh, they would have stayed in there over the night and then come out and got fed during the day and walked around. We have, uh, oh, some pots here. These are little um, terracotta pots, very similar to what we have today. But um, look at the detail on this one. This is a, one of those trays that goes under a pot. Very decorative. You don't see that anymore. And uh, these, this is some wire. Now this is pretty funny because we didn't have any electricity in this house until uh, oh 1928 or something like that. After 
after uh, Mary Speisman passed away. And uh, But the one thing I did find in this house was a doorbell, an electric doorbell. And this is probably wire left over from that. And these are some rubber buttons that would have came off a pair of rubber boots maybe or a uh, raincoat. And uh, this is one of those things that goes with the canning jar. This is what holds the lid on. So it goes over top of the lid like that. And then it, it hooks onto the, onto the rim. And that's what keeps the, the food fresh. So uh, we're getting down to the, the last interesting bits here. I saved one box of, uh, of really fun stuff, and this is part of it. So uh, this is a rim off of this. This is uh, called a radial wave, and it goes along with this thing. This is part of a chimney. Check out that hand crimping on that chimney. That's pretty amazing. You don't see that anymore. It's all machine done these days on oil lamps. And this is a whole version of that uh, shade see the radial wave going around there and what it did is it sat on top of a lamp like this and then the shade would go over top like that and help reflect the light down on the table or wherever you're at and uh, so I, I got one of these things just for this reason so I could put it back in the house so let's look inside the box here this is all the all the great stuff this one's pretty amazing so um, Mr. Speisman of course worked with leather for his job and that's what this thing is look at how it still opens it's unbelievable it's like a maybe like a really tiny billfold or something like that i'm not sure because it's got this uh little um carrying hole on the back here where you put a you put a strap through it or something like that and hold onto a onto a piece of clothing but it's got some decoration there some striping on the top and bottom but i'm just amazed that uh, hundred and some years being buried in dirt it actually opens and closes and this thing's kind of sad, but uh, it's an angel, and um, it's part of a grave marker, I imagine. And uh, it could have come, you know, maybe off of one of the one of the kids' gra <clears throat> gravestones or something like that. And it's missing a little bit in the front there, but it's in the box. And we've got a little horsey here, I'm missing his rider. But uh, look at the quality of this tool, of this uh, toy, from from back then. Uh, you, even in the plastic ones today, you don't see this good of a quality. And this is some type of uh, ceramic, very heavy. And we have a, a hairbrush. Here's the other part of it right there. This is, um, they would have combed their hair with it. That's, it's amazing that I'm holding on to this stuff. It's like digging up things from Titanic. It's just, these are all things which had owners at one time and, and they all had purpose. And, and they're, they're refound again. Like this toothbrush. This is a bone-handled toothbrush, and they had the little holes in there where uh, where hair, actual animal hair, would have been stamped into because it didn't have nylon yet. And uh, they would have brushed their teeth with this thing. It's just so so amazing to me. And there's a heel off of one of Mr. Speisman's shoes that he would have sold and, and produced. We and got little tacks there in the bottom. It's uh, three layers thick. And inside the house, when I was doing some work, I found this buried in one of the walls. This is one of the shoes that he would have made. I mean, if it wasn't, it would have been one of his competitors, which would have been really weird to have someone else's shoe. Uh, <laughs> you'd be buying your own, someone else's shoes, uh, but making your own. So most likely this was one of his. And it's still very supple. I am very, very amazed for being over, over 100 years old that it's still in good good condition i wouldn't wear it but uh, <laughs> i think it's a lady's shoe anyway but it's got that same heel on there and speaking of heels we have this thing this little turn it the other way it's got a heart shape on there now this would be on the bottom of a heel like that i'm not sure if it would make it more durable probably because it's it's metal or brass of some type of i think it's i think it's brass it doesn't feel like steel it's got some greenishness on the bottom there and uh, i guess it would also turn it into a tap shoe too if you had that screwed on there <laughs> pretty funny there is oh uh, let's go on to this thing this thing is that's a a bust looking shape of washington's head and a uh, pit of his torso there. And on the back side, we have uh, the Washington Monument. You can barely see it. I think it's upside down right there. Washington Monument. And I think this was just one of those collectible things that you, you, know, you go see Washington, D.C., and you come home with a token of, of being there. And uh, I don't know if anyone went down there from the family, 
but uh, it could have been just uh, you know some some other family went down there and, and just traded it or gave it away. And we have um, this one's this one's really pretty neat. We have this lady right there. Look at that little doll head, and uh, she was probably made in Germany, judging from what I have found online. And her hair is kind of a blue gray color, but um, out in the yard. Uh, I found more of her head, so this is more of the hair right there, and you can see it's it's still a little bit blue, but it's also closer to black. And right here is her much older sister, or larger sister, <laughs> anyway. Uh, this one is also made from in Germany, and um, so this is what uh, she would have looked like if she had the rest of her body attached to her, and there would have been a cloth doll, uh, you know, made. Uh, that's what these two holes are on the on the front and the back, oh, three on the back, to uh, to hold onto the fabric body. And there probably would have been some porcelain arms and legs too to match with the uh, with the doll. So pretty nice. And speaking of dolls, we have this little headless guy right here. Look at that <laughs> little little tiny one. And it may may or may not had clothes on it. I'm not sure, but uh, I'm definitely had a head at one time. I don't know what happened to that. And here's a here's a button. This thing is black glass with some beads around it. And uh, there's a, the holder on the back there. Unfortunately, I can only find half of it. Of all the digging that I did in the yard and the well and the cistern, I can only find the half of it. And here's a piece of money. This is a one cent piece, so it's a penny from uh, England. It's an English penny, 1940, excuse me, 1848. And that's, that's something you don't see every day, and I'm not really sure why it would have been here, because uh, it's really early, and I don't know if they would have been spending this as, uh, as currency in the United States. So there's that. But there is uh, one. This is 1897. This is a solid, solid silver quarter, and you can barely make anything out. It's, it's so far gone. It's just uh, there is a, a somewhere on one of these sides here is uh, Lady Liberty's head, her bust, and then there's... Um, I forget what's on the back of it. And and this thing, can't tell what it is, but um, if I hold this up to it, you can figure it out. This is one of those pipes that uh, they would have smoked. So Mr. Speisman and or Mrs. Speisman would have smoked a pipe. And uh, this is one of those things you probably find it in a, they're also made in Germany. A lot of things are made in Germany back then. And uh, you find these things in a, in a pub, something like that. Here's a an extended piece of that pipe which just snapped off <laughs> and uh, you'd be breaking off a section of it every time you'd use it because it's a public pipe something they would just sit on the table at a pub or if you had it in your own house uh, when you got uh, when you switched smokers you just snap off an end and then you just uh, light it up and uh, when you're done you snap off the end again for the next person pretty interesting that they would have smoked a pipe here and what else this is a this is a button. This is not a button. Okay, let's look at the back there. It is got some threads on the inside. This is called a picture nail. So uh, this part would unscrew off, and then there you'd hammer the part in the wall, and you'd hang your picture on it and screw this thing on for prettiness. So you'd have this. Um, the, the picture wire wouldn't hide behind the picture. It would be exposed. So it would be probably some decorative um, wire or or rope or something like that. And this is something you'd see on your wall above the picture. And we've got a piece of slate here. This is pretty funny. So the um, this is probably something larger, maybe one of those slates that you'd find in uh, for kids going to school. Obviously their kids went to school here. And they, uh, they would have written on something like that. And there's a couple of, uh, of things. I didn't find any pencils, but I found this. This is um, probably a compressed graphite rod. And you see it's sharpened down to a point there. So you would either write on paper or I don't know if it would show up on here, but nah, not really it does. So, but uh, that's one of their writing utensils. And we have a couple of, uh, of something you never use anymore. Uh, these are called button hooks. So the ladies and maybe some of the men in the house would uh, use this with their, with their dressing up maybe for Sunday church, and uh, you'd thread this thing, the hook, through the buttonhole, and then uh, you grab onto the back of the button. Uh, here's a good example of a button right there. 
So you'd, you'd grab through it like that, and then you'd pull it through, and then that would uh, help button your uh, your blouse or, or um, shoes. I guess they did that back then. I don't know if they had laces yet, but um, but yeah. So there's there's three of those, I believe, right there. And speaking of buttons, here is a really pretty one. This is uh, looks like some type of enameled thing. It's probably brass, but it has some blue uh, iridescent blue paint on there or something like that. But that's a very pretty, very pretty button that uh, would have popped off of somebody's really nice blouse and um, somehow just ended up in the trash. I guess you know we the things we throw out today, uh, you know will be treasures for someone else in 100 years. All of our plastic ketchup bottles and things like that. Um, this is uh, um, the back end of a shotgun shell. There's a couple of them there. And here's a couple of uh, 22 shells. They are rim fire because that's what they had back then. They didn't have the primer at the end. So right, uh, you can barely see it, but there's a little knock right in the end of the thing. And that's what would ignite the gunpowder and, uh, and set off the bullet. So they, they would have done some hunting here. And I think, okay, one last one. All right, we got, oh no, I'm sorry, two more. So we got this one right here. This is a, uh, a safety pin underneath all that tape. I'm holding it together because it broke, but it's a safety pin. I didn't know they had safety pins a hundred years ago, but um, they've probably been around a lot longer than that, but I was amazed. Solid brass safety pin. And Okay, and finally, uh, we have this one. This is, what the heck is this, right? It looks like a piece of slate, just like, uh, just like this. But it is not. It is actually carbon. It is uh, compressed uh, carbon, so it is a record. They actually had a record player back around 1907 and 1910 when all that stuff got put in the, in the cistern and the well. And here's, if you look really, really close on this side, you can see just a little bit of groove. And uh, so there was some music on here, probably unplayable now, but uh, someone broke a record and, uh, and they threw it out. Just, just amazing. Now for the house, I got to get one of those old fashioned record players with a hand crank on the side. I think it'll look pretty nice here. It is one thing to read over the history of the Speesmans, but is another thing to actually see the history and actually pick up these tangible things that they used to use on a daily basis, like this plate or one of these toys that their kids or grandkids used to play with. It is just amazing that I was able to run across all of this stuff and extend the knowledge of who these people used to be. Well, that is it for the pile of things here. Over at the rental, I got the closet done and the bedroom. That is all plastered along with some other spots on the second floor. So it's now ready to paint, but that is gonna be for another episode. So let's go over to my dad's house and see what's going on at the bathroom. Today is a plumbing day. I'm gonna be installing the hot and cold water lines, take care of the mess which is going on for the master bathroom. And I should still have some time at the end of the day to hook up the tub drain. Earlier in the morning, I threaded on four PEX connectors to the shower valve, loosely attached it to a 2x4 with a couple of screws, and screwed that 2x4 to the studs in the wall, along with two other 2x4s for the fittings for the tub spout at 20 inches off the floor, and the shower head at 80 inches. On the pipe for the tub spout, I slip on a copper crimp ring and crimp the pipe onto the fitting. Then I cut the pipe to size with a CPVC cutter and crimp the pipe onto the valve. I repeat the same process, crimping on the pipe between the shower head and the valve. The supply lines are in a really tight place, so I cut off a short piece of pipe and crimp on an elbow. Then I attach the line to the hot side of the valve, do the same for the cold, and tighten the valve onto the 2x4. Inside the closet, I drill holes through the floor for the supply lines, thread them down into the basement, and nail on a few pipe straps so the pipes stay in place inside the wall. All right, the next thing to do is to get rid of all of the CPVC plumbing. There was a time in my life, I think I was about 17 years old, when uh, I put this stuff in and I thought CPVC was the best thing in the world. And, and really there wasn't a whole lot of other choices out there. 
um, I'd say before I started working with this stuff, I was sweating copper pipes and I was pretty good at it. I wasn't, you know, the best. Every now and then I'd have a leaky joint. And if you've ever worked with copper, if you've ever had to repair a broken joint um, on the on a copper pipe, it is kind of tricky. So you have to make sure there's no water left in the pipe. Otherwise, when you apply heat to the pipe, uh, the water will just suck all that heat away. And it makes it really impossible to solder anything to it. And if you have just a little bit of uh, water in the pipe, then you just, it creates steam. And then the steam goes in and shoots out the joint you're trying to fix. And uh, <laughs> it's just so frustrating when that happens. And before that, I was working with, um, there's a lot of pipe here, uh, and it's wet. Uh, I was working with uh, the galvanized steel, and that stuff is just um, really hard to work with also because it's, it's just so much manual labor. A lot of with the arms and then the pipe dope gets everywhere and it's just, just a big mess. So I thought that CPVC was really the best stuff ever. And I used it for quite a long time, probably, oh, seven to ten years. I put it in the apartments and then uh, I found out that it had lead in it and nobody wants to have lead in their water. So another thing is I wasn't a big fan of was the smell of the glue. You know, you had to have uh, good ventilation and uh, and a respirator, which I didn't really use much of back then. So I'm sure I lost a lot of brain cells in the process, but um, and you get kind of high from it, <laughs> which I suppose was a good or bad benefit depending on who you are. And so I just tried to phase it out. And uh, the next thing that came out was PEX. So I replaced everything in the apartments with PEX and it's just so much easier to work with. There's not even any kind of wait time when you uh, put a joint together. Um, as with this stuff, you have to wait maybe half an hour to an hour for the glue to dry before you apply water pressure to it. Otherwise, it could pop open a joint. So again, PEX is like the new best thing ever. And mom knew about that, so she replaced uh, a lot of the stuff in this house with PEX tubing. So from where the water line comes in over on the other end, where the kitchen's at, all of that is new PEX all the way up to about where I'm standing right now. Uh, uh, above the, the basement floor. So that will be super easy for me because I can just replace all this with PEX and tie into the new and attach on to the stuff from the shower here. And uh, my life will be so much easier. This is one of the unions from the master bathroom shower faucet. And <laughs> as I was unscrewing the CPVC pipe out of it, the thing sheared right off. So to get it out of there, I use a hacksaw blade without the hacksaw attached and cut a pie-shaped slice out of the pipe, being careful not to cut too deep and go into the threads of the union. Next, with a hammer and screwdriver, I knock out the little pie piece and pry the rest of the pipe out with a screwdriver. Now, I wrap some Teflon tape around the PEX fitting and tighten the fitting onto the union. For the second problem of the day, I crack the union, tightening down the fitting on the other supply line. Since I don't know the manufacturer of the faucet, I can't get replacement parts. So out goes the old faucet, and in goes a new one that mom had sitting around as a backup. On the back side, I slide a board between the faucet and the wall, then secure it along the bottom and the top. I clamp the faucet down to the board with two copper-plated pipe straps. This thing isn't going anywhere. I clean up the copper pipe going to the shower head with crocus cloth, apply some paste flux to the pipe and the PEX fitting with my finger and temporarily hold the fitting onto the pipe with a block of wood. Then I apply some heat with a torch, solder the fitting onto the pipe and wipe away any excess solder with a dry cloth. After the pipe cools, I slide on the PEX, crimp the connection to the shower head and to the faucet. Next, I crimp on a few shutoff valves and continue on with more pipe. The last junction point upstairs goes to the bathroom sink. Unfortunately, I couldn't replace this section of CPVC without breaking out the wall. So I glued on two CPVC to PEX fittings. 
After about five minutes of letting the glue dry, I crimp on the connections from the shower faucet and the supply lines leading in from the basement. In the basement, I extend the hot and cold water lines going up from the bathtub and connect them over to a couple of T's that connect into the shower and the main water supply. Do you know how problems generally go in threes? Well, here's the third one for the day. After I pressurized the water line, I found a leak between one of the CPVC and PEX fittings. So what I gotta do is shut off the main water to the house, go over here to the basement sink, drain off all the pressure from the first floor, and now I can go fix that leak. I cut the fitting out with a hacksaw blade because the CPVC cutter doesn't fit. Then I cut out four inches of PEX so I have some room to work. The remaining water gets drained out of the pipe and the pipe and the fitting get cleaned. I glue on the fitting and crimp on a PEX coupler. I'm gonna give the CPVC glue an hour to dry this time before connecting up the PEX. So while I wait, I'm gonna go hook up the tub drain. I line up the trap with the T above it and take a measurement. Then I cut the pipe on the miter saw and glue the pipe between the trap and the T. I leave the rest of the trap unglued until later. On the other side of the trap, I use a plumber's level to gauge a quarter inch per foot pitch to the elbow in my right hand. Place a mark where it needs to go and cut the pipe with an oscillating saw. As I was finishing up the cut, I noticed the pipe moved a little. So I wiggled it and the elbow popped right off. I guess bad things come in fours now. After cleaning up the old pipe, I glued on a new elbow and a new piece of pipe. Then I dry fit an elbow, take a measurement between the trap and the elbow, cut a piece of pipe on the miter saw, clean everything up, and glue the pipe onto the other side of the trap. I dry fit the elbow one last time and place a mark between the pipe and the elbow so I don't lose its position when I take it apart one last time before gluing. The elbow gets glued with the mark lined up and the pipe gets glued into place. It's been about an hour now and I finished crimping on the last piece of PEX. I turn the water back on and no leaks. There's one thing I forgot to mention about the plumbing and that's on the bathtub shower faucet. So you noticed I didn't put any shutoffs there and that's because they are built into that style faucet. All you gotta do is open and close them with a blade screwdriver. So that's it for this episode. If you like what you saw, hit the thumbs up button. If you're new to the channel or haven't subscribed yet, hit subscribe and don't forget to ring that notification bell. Caesar and I will see you next time. Hold on a second here. I didn't shut the water off. <laughs>I'm going to give the CPBC clue, clue, clue. It doesn't have a clue. I'm going to co clue together, clue together. I knew I'd mess it up too. <laughs> so while I'm waiting, I'm going to cut, I'm going to cut together. I'm going to glue together the tub drain. I found a leak in between uh, something and something else. The tangible history of this stuff, where they ate off of this plate, where they used that fork, where they, uh, where they killed this pig. <laughs>